All right, morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jens Jensen with Jensen Ecology based out of Madison. Uh, and here today to talk about natural areas. Um, we do natural areas restoration. We'll kind of talk about that and kind of like what that means and um, considerations of kind of restoration of natural areas and recreation and uh, kind of stewardship on, on a lot of different scales. We work on small scales from you know half an acre to an acre up to thousands of acres. So, so we kind of have different considerations and we often say that on smaller scales, you have more details and larger scales, less details, just because you cannot really, you, you can't really afford to do um, highly detailed work on, uh, on a large scale, which probably makes sense. So just a quick introduction to, to myself and, and my firm. We're Midwest-based ecological restoration and consulting. So we do both the design and consulting and the implementation and stewardship. Based in Madison, but we do stuff around the Midwest. And we do kind of an ecological restoration, like planning, inventory, design, master planning um, and some mapping, some like in, in, you know, invasive species or endangered species mapping. And we do implementation such as you know, installation, restoration, fire, invasive control, et cetera. Uh, we have done some kind of stormwater and stream restoration projects, in which a lot of those projects we have to collaborate with people like engineers, landscape architects. I mean, Roy and Jeff Epping and Austin Eichheit are often collaborators. We like to work on sites that have collaborative nature to them and bring experts in to kind of tackle a lot of different problems. Um, threatened and endangered species, I might have mentioned that. Uh, and then um, forestry we get into a little bit. And we, we've, over the years, we've done a fair bit of work on golf courses, which we'll kind of talk about some of those here. Um, so we kind of talk about native Midwest ecosystems. I mean, uh, there's a lot of talk about prairie restoration. It's not just prairies, but I think that was kind of the dominant ecosystem in a lot of environments we're dealing with. Um, and you know, this was uh, this was an ecosystem that kind of evolved uh, the natural and human influence patterns, such as fire and large grazers like elk and bison and things like that, and the kind of that soil structure um, that that developed over 12,000 years or so since the last ice age. So that's kind of some of the processes we try to recreate or reintroduce. You know, we can't really obviously necessarily um, bring things back to what they were, but we attempt to kind of mimic those processes and, and, and try to um, try to get them back on the landscape in, in, in kind of whatever way is, is, is really practical. And so, you know, we, we throw around a lot of terms, you know, like restoration, recreation, or is it just large scale gardening? You know, what what, what kind of terms are we using? And I guess, really, if you think about what gardening is, gardening is just kind of manipulating manipulating land and, 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 and the plants, you know, that are on it. And so isn't that really what we're doing when we're doing restoration? Um, because are we really able to restore? Are we able to restore uh, a community that doesn't exist anymore and that would take thousands of years to recreate? And maybe maybe we could in, in a few lifetimes or so, but, you know, in even in 20... 20 plus years or so, like, you know, what are we seeing return to the soil? How are we rebuilding that up? I think over time we could, but it's, it's kind of hard to know um, on our short time horizons, our, our short lifespans, really kind of what we can, what we can achieve. Um, so really we're trying to recreate the native plant communities um, and the goal being biodiversity. Aesthetics are, are definitely a big part of it because, you know, we, we, we want people to be attached to these landscapes, to care about them and aesthetics really matter. You know, sustainability, um, and like we are saying, reintroducing some of these native processes like disturbance, um, which is fire, you know, f often fire or grazing. Sometimes you can kind of reintroduce with different species or maybe even bison on a larger scale. And then, um, other disturbances, just like clearing, you know, blowdowns or things that would happen to kind of open up woods. And then the, 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 the disturbance regimes you get there. And, you know, we match the plants, the existing site conditions, you know, we're not, for the most part, we're not introducing new soil and new substrate. We're just we're just using using the conditions that are there and matching matching the conditions. Um, and some of the things you know, uh, genetic diversity is, a, is 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 a big part of what we look at because I think you know more diverse landscapes are more resilient to to uh, to climatic and changes and 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 uh, other other changes that may occur. Um, groundwater recharge. Is definitely a big part of it too you know trying to get less runoff and trying to get water to kind of infiltrate the ground is, is, is definitely a big a big um, uh, focus on, on a lot of our on, on a lot of our projects and also sense of place I think like 
when you have landscapes that kind of fit this, the, the place you're in, you have more sense of place and it's not like a co cookie cutter approach to everything. Um, and, and hopefully that, hopefully over time, maybe that does then, you know, connect people to the landscape more in their overall surroundings. And then maybe they would kind of care more about conservation and, um, and, and, and their local environment. I think that's kind of one of the goals too. Um, you know, stewardship is just another word we use for, uh, for maintenance, you know, stewardship of our land, of our of, of the landscapes we work in, and some of the tools and that we use kind of after after installation is, you know, we work these 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 landscapes we're working in are constantly changing, so we're reseeding, we're replanting based on, you know, if we happen to to seed during a drought year, you know, like like this year for instance, we've had some instances where we'll, you know, seeds will lay dormant for a while, so things may not even germinate until the right conditions. But we just have to be patient. So, but then maybe we reseed over time, or we have a large site and we have certain areas of the site that are not doing as well, so we harvest seeds, move them around. Maybe we replant. Um, you know, mowing. We we tend to mow sites for the first few years just to keep some of the annual annual weeds, annual species down for that nurse crop, so so species can come up. Um, invasive. In, invasive control is is constant you know things just are always coming in so trying to keep those things at bay uh, prescribed fire which we always like to show fire pictures fire um, fires can can be exciting and and, and very um, very effective tool um, and the last thing I would say is adaptive management adaptive management simply means we adapt to the to the site you know as the sites you know we, we have this nice laid out plan as to what how we do things but as the site changes as site conditions change we adapt our plan to fit it you know, we can't just be in the static kind of nature of thinking like, all right, well, it's June 15th, we have to do this one thing, or it's two years from the planting, like we should be doing this. Well, the site changed or the site is reacting differently to our management um, practices. You know, how do we adapt them to, to get the goals out of the site? Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about climate change and, uh, and, and some of the uncertainty with it that's 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 out there and that, that, that may be, you know, I was on this webinar, this this winter with some folks, Austin Eichscheid and some other folks from, from Europe, actually, we talked a lot about this, like how do we sort of design for that? And I think the main thing is the uncertainty. I think, I think that is there. Um, we really don't know a lot of things that will occur, but things are changing. And I think the biggest thing is the durability built into doing, doing projects such as these, these uh, more, more diverse landscapes, diverse land is definitely more durable, more susceptible to drastic change. Because if you have, 50 to 60 species on a site, you know, something will, ad chances are something will adapt to that better than a monotypic landscape. You know, it, it'd be just like if, you know, it, you know, if a sickness or something came through this room, we would all react differently because we all have different genes. You know, if, if, if we have, but if we were all kind of clones of each other, like a, um, a monotypic, you know, a, a row of green ash trees down a boulevard or, or, or a, a cornfield or a soybean field or whatever, those are kind of going to, 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 to all react the same way. So, um, not only the type, uh, the number of species, but then just within the species, there's the, uh, some genetic diversity and then it, it does enhance over time. Um, we've had, um, so th these are just some, some photos, some examples of, of some of the sites we've worked on, but this one in particular, I think is, is a little more, um, so it's, it's, it's probably a little hard to tell from this angle, but this is actually a backwater of the Mississippi river where we've done some projects over the years. And these are, these are, uh, white Lotus plants which are typically right at the water level and these had stems that were about six or seven feet tall because the water level had fluctuated so much they flowered when the water was up the water came down really quickly and these lotus were sticking out of the ground about this this tall and this is usually a plant that floats on the surface it was really odd to see that and you know the, it's the mississippi so the water level is managed but it just kind of goes with this kind of um these weather, maybe some more of these weather extremes we're seeing. I mean, we, we were out in the river <clears throat> this summer. Um, some of our sites were eight, eight feet underwater and they finally came down. It came down like eight feet in two weeks and then they go back up and it's just these wild fluctuations in weather. So having, having that adaptability, I think, I think is, is really key. And the other thing we, we like to talk about, again, kind of uh, transforming, you know, the diversification of our sites, transforming more monotypic stands into more diverse stands. The, this is an example of a, <clears throat> a golf course complex we worked on in Adams County, about an hour and a half north of Madison. And it was just rows and rows of red pine. Um, and so the, the red pine were cleared to put in this golf course, but in amongst the golf course we did 
hundreds of acres of sand barrens. This is all sandy, very sandy soil. This was at the bottom of Glacial Lake, Wisconsin, back in the in the Ice Age. So it was an ice. It was a uh, glacial lake for thousands of years. So there was just sand, and there's hundreds of feet of sand. It's 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 pretty interesting. Um, but what we did is we essentially took a monotypic planting. It was rows of red pine that were just there for for pulp and um, introduced. Um, we had some remnant species to work with, but we introduced sand prairies and sand barrens throughout it. So again, we're diversifying that landscape as opposed to you know get, get, getting away from the from the mono, uh, monotypic stands. Here's a, um, another few examples. This just kind of shows some of the some of the processes. This is kind of a typical like this is actually a site that Roy and I have worked on together, pretty close to here, where we just drilled in native seed into old turf. You know, now we have a prairie and. You know, um, this was another site in Madison, a golf course site where we, um, my client had donated money to the city of Madison to, to, to redo this golf course. We introduced a bunch of natural areas into it. And one of the issues they were having out there is they had a bunch of these big legacy oak trees all around the site. And, and, and they had a bunch of other trees that were, they were really needed to go, like non-native trees that were planted in weird spots. But these oak trees were not regenerating because they were mowing underneath everything high compaction underneath these oak trees and stuff. And the very first year after we started converting some of these areas that are colored purple, orange, blue, et cetera, are all the areas we reseeded. The very first year we had oak seedlings coming up because these are no longer, these are managed more of a natural area now. So we have a forest of oak seedlings. Now, obviously not all those will survive, but that's kind of what the goal is. Cause a lot of these trees are kind of at the end, their, end, end of their life. And we have to um, think about the next generation. Um, this site over here, which I'll talk a little bit more about in detail too, is a site in Northwest Illinois in the Rock River. It was an old steel mill that we turned into a, uh, a prairie park, about 11 acres. It was a really interesting um, um, transformation out there. So now maybe just to get into a few project examples, uh, a little more in detail. This is a site that, that Roy knows really well. This is a natural garden natives. Uh, this is part of Midwest Ground Covers in St. Charles, Illinois. Um, I've been working with them for about eight years on this is their production facility. And a big part of what they wanted to do was, um, and have been doing is harvest a lot of their runoff for irrigation. They have an irrigation pond here. And the site, you can kind of see the arrows. This is a very rough diagram of kind of how this, how things run off. And then they, they want it to go back into the irrigation pond so they can then use that again to water their plants that they're, these are all, this is a native plant nursery. So it makes sense for them to gather up all that water. Now they also want the water to get there relatively clean so it doesn't clog up this irrigation pond so they have to continually dredge it. Um, the other thing is they, they have quite a bit of natural areas. They have these nice oak woodlands and they have a little bit of prairie areas and these bioswales in a, that they wanted to manage to kind of show as a demonstration. Um, <clears throat> and um, so we kind of, we've been helping, helping that with them over the years. Um, another thing was there's a wetland that the irrigation pond flows into and then it goes into this catch basin and then it flows out into the um it flows out into this ditch onto highway this is highway 64 decent you know re relatively busy road and then just goes into the regular stormwater drain what we wanted to do is re-meander this stream around there was a building here that it was eroding to so we re-meandered the stream through the woods and found a more natural course for this stream that was just it wasn't even a stream, it was a ditch that was lined with broken concrete and it was just a straight channelized thing. So we wanted to, and we'll kind of go in more details there uh, later. The last thing are demonstration gardens that uh, Austin Eishide and I worked on uh, a few years ago um, to use all native plants, but more of an, like, an aesthetic um, focus to them to show how they could be used on different scales. And we'll kind of show, show pictures of that. Um, these are the, uh, th this is the main, if you kind of, it's a little hard to tell, but up in these pictures, you can see the hoop houses. These are some of the, um, where, where they raise some of the plants and a lot of, there's some elevation change because there's this flat area they created. So what they did was, uh, this is a main kind of drainage area that comes through and there was maybe about 15 to 20 feet of elevation change. So what, what was done was to create these um, kind of V-shaped, um, rock sills where you'd have a low point in the middle of the V and it points upstream. So what that does is it channelizes the water. It creates a step pool system where water would cascade down and kind of scour out this step pool. It would then settle out and then it would step down again and again. And by the time, the idea is that by the time it gets down to the irrigation pond, it's relatively clean. A lot of the sediment has been trapped and it's been all planted with native plants. So this was the first year they did it where things are just establishing. And this is several years later where it's the same view it's all filled in and that's really helping trap 
a lot of that sediment, a lot of that runoff and filtering it before it gets to the pond. Um, I think it's, it's really been pretty successful. And this is the outlet of the irrigation pond that goes down towards um, Route 64 that we had talked about, where it's just this straight drainage ditch. And again, it's, it's probably a little hard to tell from this photo, but we re-meandered, it was just a straight shot and it was going right at the corner of this, of this building. So it was, it was eroding it. We re-meandered through the woods. We found low, natural low points and created this kind of riffle and pool structure where that was during construction. And then this is after a decent rain where it's actually, it's flowing and then there's a pool every, there's about four pools to make up. So, so the water flows through a riffle, it slows down in a pool where sediment can fall out. And it does that about three or four times before it finally gets back to the, to the main drainage ditch. Um, so again, it's trying to keep more water on site. It's trying to have this, the water that does ultimately, because we can't control all the rain, if you get a six inch rain event or something, um, but we're trying to hold that rain on site. And we're using sort of more natural stream processes, but then also some, some, some native vegetation to stabilize things and help filter things out as well. Um, there's a few more shots. This is, this is actually that stream um, looking upstream. Here's the outlet from the wetland. And here's one of the pools. It, it sort of bends around a riffle here and it slows down into this pool. And it actually has to flow slightly uphill to get out of that. And then you can see it runs again. So the, the riffle and pool structure is something you'd find more in nature. So trying to emulate these processes we see. This is the wetland on site that was mostly dominated by reed canary grass. So we were, um, this is kind of a before and an after. And then after we had treated, there was a lot of water plantain and just a whole forest of, of, of arrowhead and like rice cut grass and blue joint grass and things like that. So being very selective in what we do, kind of recognizing, you know, the native species that are in site and working with them. <clears throat> uh, these are the demonstration gardens. There's a picture of Austin and I. I'm sure he's done a talk here recently, but um, you, you may recognize him. Austin's a very well-known garden designer, Not uh, had done a lot of work with Midwest, not necessarily with natives. I mean, he used natives, but he used cultivars and he used non-natives too. So Krista, Krista from Midwest Ground Covers brought us together to kind of work together on these, on these designs of different scale gardens um, using all natives but again, trying to make, you know, having aesthetics be a big part of this, you know, to show how they can be used in, in different settings. So, you know, we went from kind of smaller scale to medium to medium sort of tall, like aggressive species, and then to kind of larger scale that could be like a, either a larger scale yard or a corporate campus or something like that. And, you know, this design, for instance, had um, like a lot of Agosta key and, uh, um, a little blue stem and switchgrass is so kind of more aggressive, like tall species. So if you were a little more comfortable with species like that, it was a small scale, but it, like small footprint, but kind of more aggressive species. This is kind of more, I would say, sort of residential and sort of part shade, you know, with things like um, blue stem goldenrod, uh, you know, uh, Asclepias tuberosa, winged loofstrife, spiderwort, things like that. And then when we get to the larger scale, this is a big swath of things where you have bigger groups. I think on a larger scales, you have larger groups of, of, of plants as opposed to just like more individual because you're sort of looking out. It's sort of like the difference between looking out at a prairie where you see things from a distance and you see big swaths and textures as opposed to sort of individuals. So I think that kind of gets back to the you know, larger scale, less detail, smaller scale, maybe a little more detail just in general. I mean, that's just kind of what, what you can really realistically do. Um, this is, yeah, forgive me. This is a very dense, dense slide with, with a lot of information, but this is, I, I think this was a very interesting project. This was the remediation project that I referred to a few slides ago, but this is in Sterling, Illinois. This was the Northwestern steel site. That was about a 13 acre site, you know, employed, thousands of people for 120 years and then in the early 2000s it closed and the land was acquired by the city they demolished it they had we had to do re remediation at, at a firm i used to work at at cardinal that we had remediation engineers and i was in charge of this project even though i'm not an engineer i can play one on tv i guess but um we had to cap the site because it had contaminants we had to cap the site with minimum of three feet of, of un, uncontaminated soil. So that, that equated to about 35,000 cubic yards of material, which, um, which is a lot. That's three acres, uh, 11 acres of minimum of three feet of soil. So we had about 1,500 trucks coming in and out. Um, that was the only way to get so, soil there. We, you, know, there you, you can't get barge traffic on the rock. This is on the Rock River, about 40 miles upstream of like the Quad Cities, roughly, if you know where Sterling Rock Falls is, if you know roughly where that is. Um, so the building got demolished, 
we put all the soil on it, we vegetated it, and the whole idea was for it to absorb a lot of storm water before it went to the river, recreate some of these natural uh, bioswales, you know, some, some bioswales and, and storm water capture on the site. And so, you know, it, it, was, uh, it, was, it was a very complicated project. I learned a lot about remediation, but just a lot about dealing with soil such as that. You know, we, we had three to four feet of soil and then at some point there was just a barrier because it was it was broken up concrete, it was compacted g gravel, et cetera. So like that water would just, if it ever got down to that point, it would hit a hard pan and then move laterally. So like what's happening with the soil underneath? And I still think after about 10 years of working on this project, we now have a, ni a, a really nice established prairie with a lot of, you know, pollinators and turtles and frogs. We have, we have a nice pond and things like that too. But over time, how will that soil build itself. I think it's, I think it's an interesting study to think about. Um, I know, you know, we started off the talk talking about how we don't import a bunch of topsoil, this, or a bunch of soil. This was obviously a very unique situation where it was a remediation. So we had to bring in this fill just to have a substrate. And we had the, um, and, and, we, and we just had, we, we just had the practical issues with, there were contaminants on site. So um, it's a really interesting transformation. And it's, it's been really eye opening to see a site turn into from a steel mill that, you know, deindustrialization, and now we have this park, and it's uh, it's interesting. I think the community likes it. Um, obviously, there's a lot of people that used to work at the plant have probably various different feelings about it, but that were just these these processes that were out of people's control for you know the the plant closing, et cetera. But uh, it's, it's it's been an interesting site to to be involved with. We now actually burn out there, so it's it's now an actually like established prairie. We manage it as a prairie mostly, and. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, definitely a learning experience there. Um, so I'd have to talk about, this is one of our bigger projects we've had for the last uh, six or eight years. This is uh, Sand Valley Golf Course and Complex. This is, uh, I'd, I'd mentioned this briefly as well, but this is in um, central Wisconsin, so Adams County. So, um, you know, we're obviously down here in Walworth County. This is Adams County here. So the golf course is about the northern part of Adams County, right in the smack in the middle of this blue blob, which that blue blob is, the rough extent of Glacial Lake, Wisconsin. So if you ever go north on 39, north of uh, north of Madison, past Portage, and then the landscape just kind of flattens out and it seems a bit like very sandy. Um, like there's a lot of cranberries growing up here and things like that. That was the bottom of a glacial lake. And it was a glacial lake for 5,000 years or so, maybe, maybe more, maybe less. And then the lake drained at the end of the last ice age. And um, there was an ice dam at the south end of the lake that supposedly failed within a matter of days. And this, this whole lake drained. I mean, this is a huge area and it scoured out the dells. So if you go to the Wisconsin Dells, you see all these sandstone cliffs and stuff. Those were all scoured out by the, by the action of this huge lake draining in, in, in potentially a couple days, some geologists think. And a lot of the sand went down to the, um, went down the lower Wisconsin River here, which is why there's these really nice sandbars now that are really fun to canoe and camp on. Um, so what's left is a giant chunk of sand. And this was some of the sand we were dealing with. This was actually um, taken from a helicopter. We got to do, my, my client had, had, had rented a helicopter for us to, to, to go on these tours, which was kind of interesting. We don't get to ride in helicopters every day, but um, that was a fun thing. But when they had taken out a lot of the, this was all red pine plantations. So this was initially homesteaded, I don't know, back in maybe the late 1880s or something like that, but it's, it's pure sand. I mean, it's really hard to grow anything without irrigation. So then it turned over to um, the timber companies and most of the timber companies in, in the area, in Wisconsin, especially since they cut all the white pine, I mean, you know, short history, you know, cut a lot of the white pine to build Chicago and big cities, build Chicago twice, you know, um, and then, and then the, uh, a, a lot of the forestry then was pulpwood. So it's, it's for paper, it's for cardboard, it's for uh, particle board, things like that. So it's, it's red pine. It's not exactly high quality timber. You know, it's pallet wood or it's pulpwood, something like that. So the, the mills used to actually own a lot of this land and you know, with people using a lot less paper and things like that, obviously like the timber industry has changed a lot. So my client had bought this land um, to build this golf course because they had built golf courses all over the kind of all over the world and they really like the sand and to shape it. It's, it's probably a, another story for another day. But anyways, this was cut. And then what they had done is sort of stripped some of the sedge side off to, to create their shaping. But it was just surprising to see this, this much sand. It's, it's, it's just incredible. It's, it's almost like a, a desert in the middle, in, in the middle of Wisconsin. Um, 
I, I, I'm, I'm definitely used to it now, having worked there for several years, but it was shocking to, when, when dealing with that much sand and um, how, how quickly that drains and how hot it can get and things like that and just the different organisms that inhabit it, um, it's a totally different environment. And uh, it's been a really good learning experience, but a really fun one to kind of learn how to, a lot of the sand species are pretty unique and pretty interesting to deal with. So um, this was kind of an aerial map of the site before and you can sort of see there's, there was a lot of topography out here and you, um, where it wasn't perfectly flat like a lot of other the sand country is. So those were areas where we knew there'd be some, some remnants we could deal with. Um, you know, areas that were not farmed, they were not heavily forested. Um, you know, there wasn't forestry equipment on them because they were too, too steep to, uh, to get equipment on or to manage or things like that. So we knew we'd had remnant sand barren communities and that's a very unique thing and sure enough when going out there while they were doing the clearing it gave us some ideas of how to kind of work with those remnants and uh, how to incorporate them in the, in, into the golf course property but then also um, also also try to recreate them where we could so you know the initial site conditions pine plantation you know so it it was definitely a modified landscape but it wasn't tilled every year like like typical row crops and it wasn't you know, sprayed with herbicide every year, like typical row crops. So we had a lot of things like, you know, there's a lot of lupin and inhabiting with the lupin is a federally endangered butterfly, Carner blue butterfly, uh, Kirtland's warbler, uh, a bird that we have worked with and slender glass lizard, among other things are, there's actually some, some lizards, you know, there's, there's, you know, with the sand you get, there's actually a legless lizard, sort of looks like a garter snake, but it has a, a tail that'll break off to get away from predators. Technically a lizard because it has nostrils and movable eyelids. So it's, it's the anatomy is, um, Anyways, it, it, if you see it, you don't think lizard because it doesn't have legs, but interesting species. So we would have, so I think, you know, th this sort of illustrates some of the things. We go out to a site, we got to first identify what's there and what's kind of remnant, what's not. And so that was one of the first steps is like, all right, what do we have? What do we have to work with? What, what, what can we start with? You know, we don't want just those, those little remnants that we have. We want to highlight them. We want to like hold on to them and help them expand. And then we can then recreate other areas that are less... Of, of, of less quality. Um, some of the remnants, I mean, we had these beautiful, like to me, this is a perfect kind of sand barren oak, jack pine, uh, black oak, these scrub oaks that, that would re-sprout re from a fire. And it's mostly jack pine is the native, um, red pines are not quite native there. Jack pine is kind of the native barren tree and jack pine is a fire defendant, dependent species where the cones need fire to open up. Um, but you kind of have this, foreground of sand prairie species with then transitioning to, to more thicker kind of brush. And that, that's kind of always this successional landscape that, that we were dealing with. Also, you'd have these sand blowouts, some of which were anthropomorphic that were probably created from, from you know, over tilling. And then they just never came because once things become sand, it's very hard to get them back to be vegetated. And so you'd have these big stretches where you have plants like Hudsonia, which is this false heather that, that was there and not a plant you can get in the nursery trade or anything you just have to have the have it and then have the conditions be right for it uh, a plant you would find on you know a lot of things we were seeing here were plants you'd find on like lake michigan sand dunes you know but they were in the middle of the state um or or even further afield than that and you know some of the other remnants this was an interesting this was actually this huge sand blow was actually created by atvers just over the years they would go out there and just do donuts and whip around and so they would keep it sandy but it actually made for a really interesting false heather jack pine kind of savannas like around the edge you know i think we think about natural and like what does natural mean and like you know humans have been modifying the landscape to some extent you know before us native americans definitely you know burned the landscape they obviously you know did a lot of mound building they, they modified things so i think we think about our place in the landscape we are part of it too and that's kind of goes back to my comment about is it large-scale gardening well maybe it is and like so what if it is because we're a part of it and we're taking an active role so seeing things like that you would initially think oh like a knee-jerk oh that that was sort of destroyed by by people on utvs and yeah maybe that's not the best way to do it but it also kind of highlighted some 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 landscapes you probably would have found out there prior to to development as well and um yeah, so, so going back to, th this is all red pine plantations, and you can still see some of the rows. So a lot of the trees were cleared. And what we'd find underneath is that 
in between the rows of pine, there were some remnant things. You know, we'd, in, in the middle of these red pine plantations, we'd find orchids sometimes, or you'd find like prince's pine or Indian pipe, you know, really interesting species that just had hung on because, again, this was not a tilled field every year. It wasn't, it wasn't tilled. Sure, sure, it was modified, but it wasn't um, as modified as heavily. So, you know, we had the remnants, and then we decided, well, we have to reseed. So several hundred acres we reseeded. We figured about every golf course is about 80 to 120 acres of turf. There's four golf courses out there now. But we've done six to 800 acres of restoration. So you, you normally think about... <clears throat> golf courses and maybe you don't think about conservation but I think on this in this hand you could say that the site is better off now that it's had the golf course because the golf course has allowed us to do the restoration because before it was just red pine plantation and it would have stayed in rotation every 60 years they would have cut those trees they would have replanted and it would have stayed that monotypic uh, landscape for the first maybe 15 years of a red pine plantation the site can kind of maintain some diversity because some of the forbs and things can survive without things canopying but once it gets to 20, 30 years of age, then it just becomes almost just a sea of red pine with just uh, like pine needles in the, in the understory. So that rotation is not really, you know, that healthy for the overall ecology. So we seeded, we mostly broadcast seeded across the sand surface because we don't want to bury um, our seed in the sand. You know, native seed likes to fall on the surface. And we would have these little, um, sometimes we'd run it over with equipment to, to make these little indentations in the soil from like, cause there were a lot of bulldozers and stuff out there and our seed would settle in these little rows. Like you can kind of see it now. And the golf course architects we worked with hated that because they saw those lines, but that was the only way we could get our seed to, 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 to hold in. Cause on this sand and you get a little moisture and you get the freeze thaw over the winter really helped. And I, I, I kept telling them, well, over time, you're not going to see these lines. And sure enough, you don't see them now. But that was just a way we had to do it on that scale. Um, so we're starting to see some development. And then, you know, more kind of seedling development come through. And then we, we'd get surprised. This is impossible probably to see at, uh, on this slide. But this is a plant called Pink Cordalis, which is a native annual. Um, it almost looks like a bleeding heart. But it's a native annual plant that's really pretty rare. And it would just pop up randomly. And we would collect its seed. It shows up in sites that are very disturbed. So a site like this has been denuded of vegetation. It would just kind of pop up. And uh, that was one I had to like, I had to get old like botany books out for. I was totally stumped by, um, but things like that. Again, a site like this, you're running into conditions where you don't always see, and it's it's just, you know, keeps you fresh. It's fun to learn. So, so some of our seedings that, that, that have developed over the years, these are slightly out of date, but we've got, Big fields of like uh, this is Penstemon grandiflorus, which is a really great penstemon, but you need sand. You know, you need sand. These are hard to replicate some of these things without all the sand we had out there. Um, again, some of the you know incorporating some of the species into the golf course or some of the um, some of the kind of resident. They have little cottages and things to rent on site. Uh, Prince's pine. That's a chemophilia. That's a, that's again a one. Uh, some of the pine barren species that we would just find even on the north facing slopes that were that were uh, shadier and a little bit cooler you'd almost get some boreal type plants and that's one of them like you get wintergreen you get princess pine you get like indian pipe you get some of those lady slipper orchids things like that this is another really fun plant that again just showed up this winged pigweed and it it creates these big globes that are they're this lime green color it's really cool it kind of dots the sand but again, it just kind of goes away after time. And then when you get a first frost, it turns purple and then they kind of turn into tumbleweed. So they do blow around and kind of create a bit of a mess, but that's kind of the aesthetic, you know, that they're sort of going for out there. And then with this course, we have a lot of trails and a lot of um, interpretive signs, you know, telling golfers and, hope, and, and other people, because it's open to anybody who just wants to hike. There's, there's many miles of trails out there that take you through different landscapes and you see different things. And so it's been fun having a client that, you know, has been definitely interested in doing that. Here's some of the lady slippers we would find, and we still have some just in the middle of these pine plantations. Uh, so just thinking back on this project and the opportunities being, you know, great remnant plant communities at times, not everywhere, but we, we definitely had things we could identify that we could work with. Um, and, and we did have a seed bank in some areas that would respond as well. Uh, you know, again, the very unique plant community with the sand, the sand just, just lends itself to some, some unique opportunities. Um, and it's very you know it's pretty large scale so it's fun to work on those types of scales you know you see some impact um and the other 
I think a huge thing was there was less concern with compaction in the sand. By compaction, I mean there was a lot of equipment running around to do the golf course, but the sand doesn't really compact. You know, if you run sand, if, if, if you run a bunch of equipment on soil like this that we have here, you would compact that soil so bad and it's hard to get that compaction out. Like you might not ever get it out. And sand is not really a concern because uh, it's so coarse that it doesn't really compact. It just kind of stays loose. So you don't worry about oh, it just rained four inches, like we're gonna compact that area really bad and our seed's not gonna germinate. It's like, no, it doesn't really matter. It's gonna come back. So, and in fact, you get four inches of rain and then, the, you know, that afternoon it's, it's, it's dry again. It just, it wicks through the soil so quickly. Um, some of the challenges, yeah, I mean, there was also on the large, large scale was also a challenge. It made it hard to manage like invasives, for instance, on that large scale. Um, fire management, we have been burning some sites out here but it's it's a little tricky because there's just contiguous fuel all over the place so the the chance of wildfire is definitely there i mean that's a part of the state that does actually experience wildfires um and and just the large scale in general um another aspect of this project i'll just mention briefly this is more of a forestry project but my client bought seven thousand acres of forestry land directly they own this this land up here is kind of where the golf course is 7,000 acres of forestry land just for the purpose of restoring it. And the idea is take it out of forest, leave it in forestry, but do different forest management practices. The typical rotation is you take, here, here's another photo, there, the golf course, and this is, this is the property here. But the idea is to harvest the red pine. And again, this is another helicopter view, but you just vast swaths of, of, of land where we harvest all the red pine, leave the native trees that are there. And we're in something called managed forest law, managed forest land, which is a program in Wisconsin. It's, it's a program in many states, but basically what it is, it's sort of a tax shelter for people in the forestry industry. You know, forestry was one of the bigger industries in Wisconsin many years ago, and it's still relatively large. So they kind of wrote their own similar to like ag tax credits, where if you keep it in forestry and you do the forest practices, you, you, you get a tax break on your on your property taxes, which is pretty significant. Now, typically with an MFL, you're not allowed to do these kind of different types of forest management practices but we wrote a plan and we got it approved that says we're going to cut the red pine but we're not going to replant red pine we're going to reintroduce natural processes to get native trees back what we want is the native mosaic sand barren community and how do we get that back well mother nature gives us a lot of trees um, because things are going to grow on their own and then also with introducing things like fire and other disturbance we can get uh, we can stimulate the seed bank of trees because we still have to maintain certain stocking densities per acre. It's about 600 trees per acre. And so we've actually gone out and surveyed these lands. We've surveyed about uh, 2,000 acres. We have to do about another 2,000 this summer to see what kind of trees per acre we have. And we kind of, we take data points and then we extrapolate to kind of make these maps. Um, and so far we're, 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 we're growing trees. It's, it's a little controversial in the forestry industry, but we wanted to stay with an MFL because it wasn't really realistic to come out of MFL because it would have been a huge tax hit and it wouldn't have made the project uh, viable. Um, but then also do this kind of large scale restoration. It's still just on a forestry, it's still basically a forestry project, but with these kind of diversific, uh, diversification of the landscape um, as part of it. So it's a really interesting project. We partner with people like Nature Conservancy, American Bird Conservancy to try to leverage like their their resources and expertise to help us manage such a landscape. I mean, 7,000 acres is, is a good chunk of land. Plus my client has bought a few thousand other acres that, you know, we may or may not do things on. Um, also recreation is a big part of it, you know, allowing, allowing access and, you know, some of the things out, out on the site. Um, we also have a tamarack swamp, which is really interesting um, in, in one portion of the site. You know, and some of the endangered species we're dealing with, there's a carnar blue butterfly, which we have, that's a federally endangered species. It's actually doing quite well in Wisconsin, um, but um, we have a lot of it out there. Kirtland's warbler was just delisted in 2019, um, federally delisted, but still endangered in the state. And there's still a lot of effort to, most of its population goes to the lower peninsula of Michigan and the jack pine barrens there. There are about 70 to 80 breeding pairs in Wisconsin, and they're on my client's land, the land they bought. So we're trying to like get the population um, more up to snuff there. And again, being mostly a plant community person, it's been fun to work with these experts to kind of like collaborate. You know, because I, I think collaboration is key if, you know, getting out of your silo and talking, talking to others. And um, there's that lizard I was talking about, slender glass lizard. So it looks kind of like a snake, but it's actually a lizard. Uh, greater prairie chicken is a possibility. They're in the area, but not. And then maybe some, some quail or some grouse potentially. Uh, we, we, we do have some, some quail um, 
but not Bob White, I don't think. Uh, just real quick, just a few other kind of projects to show some of the other things we're working on. We've over the last five or six years, we've had an opportunity to work on the Mississippi River doing, uh, working with the Army Corps of Engineers and some of their island restoration, which has been pretty fun. This is kind of a drone shot of one of these big sweeps of islands they, they create. This is uh, in, near Lynxville, which is uh, about 15 miles north of Prairie du Chien. Um, and so, so what this is, this, this is a project where the Army Corps has to dredge the shipping channel because this is a major highway of barges. And they have this, all this material. So what they've done is created these islands, these barrier islands for, for habitat. And this is backwater habitat for fish, for birds, um, for turtles, you know, things like that. It also breaks up the wave action and, and helps with erosion because this is, there's a lock and dam right down here. So this is just, was a big open pool that was basically a stagnant pool. So it gets that kind of, tries to recreate the floodplain that may have been there. And so we have our involvement with these projects, we're not doing the dredging, but we've been restoring, kind of working with the vegetation on site. And mostly it's trying to reestablish floodplain forests out there. So it's been interesting um, and it's been kind of fun to kind of learn the river and learn, you know, more of, more of that aspect. Um, also mapping, this was, you know, with drones and things, we've been using them to map, like this was a project in Southeast Wisconsin uh, around here and then out to Rock County. It's private landowners, but they have NRCS wetlands on their property, so they're funded by the USDA. And so we map actually Phragmites with the drone. We take aerial photos and we just kind of draw polygons. And we did it over about 2,500 acres from 21 to, th this, is, or this is our last year. We're just in the midst of doing it right now. Um, so that's a big, Phragmites, you, you may or may not know, it, it kind of looks like a giant miscanthus. It's a giant grass, super highly invasive wetland plant. And uh, it's pretty easy to see mostly on aerial photos. So if you get good enough aerial photos, you can find it and try to keep it out of wetlands. Um, and this is kind of my last slide, but just sort of thinking about, this is a project we did in Iowa at the Museum of Danish America where um, it was a 30 acre site. We designed a prairie and wetland um, complex out there. And I think it's a, it's a good example of kind of the, the human side of doing these projects. So like, you know, some lessons learned about kind of stops and starts. This is a site that we initially ins installed, but, but they didn't have the right expertise on site or oversight because it's six hours away from Madison. It's hard for me to be there and I, et cetera. But um, so got off on the, right, on, on the wrong foot. But since about 2015, we got back involved and kind of nursed the site back to health and just educated the staff on site. You know, having people, the, you know, a lot of the things we deal with, first of all, take a few years to establish second of all are very hard to identify and don't really seem like much is going on for a couple years you know people walk out there and be like oh this looks good or this looks terrible it's like no actually this looks good i remember the first time we walked out there were some photos uh, back in 2015 this is krista and peter from from midwest ground covers were involved because they have danish heritage too and you know the the directors of the museum and stuff was like jens what do you think we think this looks good and i was just we were just kind of out there like oh this is this is gone you know it, it almost was at the point where it would we would have to convert it back to turf and like just a park which would have been really demoralizing but we've stuck to it and and the staff has really bought in and so i think that like persistence and just kind of sticking to to the game plan adapting you know management um, practices to it and also knowing that you're working on a large scale and you have to prioritize things but since then we've now we just did a walk out there there was a big conference we did last last week and um the site looks really good and it's really come a long way. Now it's part of the museum that they can actually like promote. It's in a brochure. It's not just this weedy patch at the northern end of the site. So, um, so that's been pretty rewarding, frustrating at times, but I think a good illustration of it's not just the science and the biology. It's, it's you know, the people we deal with and, and how to bring them along th with it because it's a, it can seem like an esoteric thing to do this restoration, whatever we're calling it. But um. All right, thanks. Thank you.